disappearing and being replaced by handheld kiosks where you can order things. Um, there's now a McDonald's where you can order everything directly on a keypad and it shows up at the counter. It looks like there are no humans involved, although I do know there are a few people working in the back. There's actually a, a coffee shop in San Francisco that is 100% robotic uh, with no people except the people that service the equipment. So the, uh, as my chapter in the book talks about, the future is already here. It's just very unevenly distributed um, in terms of how it's manifesting itself. But you can see little hints of the future uh, everywhere you, you walk in San Francisco or New York or Chicago or LA. The future is, is coming here in the United States and people are very scared about what this means with 50% of jobs potentially disappearing over the next 10 to 20 years. If you go to the next slide. So this is uh, kind of the ecosystem of investors in the United States that I've been honored to be part of. Uh, back when we started investing in 2003, there were only two or three investors in existence in the United States that were focused on investing in education technology and workforce technology. It was, you know, it was very early days. There were human resource information systems to track employees and their ID numbers and their salaries and very basic functions. And in, in education back then, uh, it's hard to remember, uh, but you know, most schools did not have Wi-Fi. Most schools did not even have high-speed internet, uh, let alone uh, computers and technologies. Now, fast forward to today, one of our companies is a company called Learn Platform and it works with school districts in the United States um, and it keeps track of all the education technology that they're using and the average school district in the United States uses more than 600 different education technologies every year. So it's gone from a, a world where 15 years ago there was no technology in schools to now there's so much technology you know, they can't even manage all of it because it's 600 different education technology software products just weak. Um, and the same thing has happened in the investing space. So new markets is part of a global phenomenon called impact investing, where more and more wealthy people and pension funds and uh, endowments have decided, you know, we don't just want to invest money to make uh, the most possible money out of our investments. We want our money to actually improve the world, to have societal impact. Um, and in a way, this trend started 20, 25 years ago with the disinvestment campaigns, where there was a decision not to invest in South Africa until apartheid went away. There was a decision not to invest in um, you know, so-called bad investments like tobacco products uh, or um, you know, extractive uh, industries like oil and gas, etc. So it actually started out as a movement to not invest in bad things but over time has now changed so that it's about investing in good things, investing in double bottom line activities, so investing in companies that both have a positive societal return, uh, positive impact, and also generate financial return. And so every company on this space is a, either a partner or a competitor with new markets. We're mostly friends in this space. It's really not a you know, it's not like uh, other VC industries where the VCs are, are, are fighting each other for deals. We often co-invest together with almost every organization on here we've co-invested with in some way, shape, or form. I worked for three years at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, running their higher education innovation strategy. The Lumina Foundation is an investor in us. In the United States, we partner with Omidyar and Emerson Collective and University Ventures and Rethink Education. So many of these are, are partners. But overall, to summarize, uh, about six billion is now invested in education annually, locally. Uh, about 1.5 billion is in the US, and actually China and Asia is larger in size than both Europe and uh, the United States. And now China and, and India and the whole of Asia are moving faster than all of us uh, in the quote, developed world right now. So if you go to the next slide. So this is where New Markets has invested and kind of our thesis about how the world is 
becoming a more people-centered economy. There are four main uh, vectors that we pay attention to. One is the digitization of learning. Uh, and in the past, learning kind of like it's happening today with you know an audience and a, a, a panelist or a lecture being given, and that's still the way it happens in most of the world. Um, but in the United States, at least, it's now up to 30% of uh, students are uh, taking at least half of their courses in an online or blended fashion, at least in post-secondary education. Um, and we also have 50 million students in K-12 education who are now entirely online, digital, so it's not just a post-secondary phenomenon. Um, and 70% and of students take at least one course online or blended in some way now. So, you know, digital education is no longer the future, it is actually here. And so, you know, we invest in companies that are making digital learning higher quality, better, more productive, that have proven results and actually are evidence-based based on scientific research, third-party research of improved, improving outcomes. Um, in some cases, digital learning is better than in-person. And then the second category is alternative slide, pathways and... Say that again? No. No, I put the slide back up again. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so the second, second area beyond digital learning is what we call alternative pathways and credentials. And I'm really curious to hear from all of you if this is happening in the Netherlands and across Europe. In the United States, there's a big debate about the high price of higher education, of post-secondary education. It's gotten to be so high that uh, no. No. $200,000 US to go to a traditional university. Uh, that's so much, that's almost at the cost of a house in the United States. And so many, many more students are actually choosing to go to these alternative providers. And alternative providers are like a boot camp where you can learn to be a computer science programmer or learn data science or learn digital marketing. They're all digital, uh, digital skills or digital jobs. In fact, in the US, we call them new collar jobs. They're kind of the blue collar jobs of our era where you can learn information technology skills and you can get a $50,000 a year job. Um, but you don't even have to go to college. If you're actually really good at software development, you can skip college altogether. And so we invest in companies in that area that are uh, either thinking of it as disrupting the university or providing an alternative pathway, alternative credentials that get you that quality job. And the third category is actionable data. So now that we are collecting lots of information about learners through their digital learning, we have uh, uh, knowledge of what credentials and skills they've learned. You can actually use that data uh, to help people find their jobs, to help them be smarter at choosing courses, to help them be smarter at choosing their major or program of study. Uh, uh, we use nudging technology to nudge people into positive behaviors. Uh, that's, a that's a category where Companies have done very well at proving uh, uh, efficacy, improving outcomes, um, and actually also generating a financial return. We've had four successful uh, companies build and grow and sell themselves in that area in the last few years alone. And then finally, the last area um, is an area we call 21st century learning. And this is an area where we're looking for companies that have new business models or new ways of leveraging neuroscience of learning to improve outcomes. So in this area, we've invested in social emotional learning companies, a virtual reality and education company, a company that uses advertising for social good, um, a number of uh, companies that actually are looking for new ways of improving outcomes by leveraging kind of cutting edge technology. So how does all this connect to the people-centered economy? If you go to the last slide, I don't know, I want to open up for the discussion. So I was honored to meet the, the folks at I4J about a year ago now and found this idea of sort of a human-centered economy, a learner-centered ecosystem quite fascinating. 
does match what I've been seeing over the last 20 years in education investing, that we're moving from a world where people went for education and training in kind of a discrete period of time when you were younger, uh, until you were 25 years old, you would go to school, and then you would work for the rest of your life, usually at one or a small number of companies. That's not the way the world is now. Uh, in the US, more than half the people attending university are age 25 or older. Um, they're going back for reskilling, they're looking to switch careers, and the companies that we're seeing now kind of fit into this, this circle the way that I, I've redrawn the, the circle the way it is in the book. This is Jason's version of the circle. But there's now new companies involved with helping to finance the lifelong learning. And so some of the names are here, Klein, Zemo, Social Capital, Nelnet, etc. These are companies that do income sharing agreements where you can go to school for free, but you agree to pay back a percentage of your income over time. This idea was actually pioneered in Europe originally and is now growing very rapidly in the United States. Um, Wow. On the education and training front, as I mentioned before, many more companies are popping up and colleges are doing this too to offer shorter duration, uh, kind of just in time, bite sized training programs that are three weeks to 18 months in length. Um, some of these are boot camps for coding, but it goes way beyond uh, just coding. There are certificates for project management, there are certificates for accounting. There are certificates to be a truck driver or to use a backhoe uh, or to use all kinds of tech enabled uh, technologies to prove you have the skills. And there are next more than a thousand organizations in the US alone that are training people for these discrete skills and credentials, which are by chunks. And then finally, to transition happened with employers now that's in the early stages, but where employers, and I've also called them affiliations. So organizations are thinking of themselves not just as the thousand people who work at the company now, but also the five thousand alumni who use at this company. And how can we continue to leverage our alumni network? Um, how can uh, and then not even just our employees, but our, the consultants that work with us, the part-timers, the contractors, and that blends into companies like here we have, obviously, knows about Uber and Lyft, but we also have companies like ShiftGig, and staffing agencies are changing such that people are now affiliated with uh, uh, an agency or an affiliation that will give you multiple jobs in, in sometimes one day at a time, sometimes two or three months at a time, uh, it's been estimated that a third of the United States workforce is now uh, working with some sort of agency or association model uh, in order to do multiple jobs at the same time and work for multiple employers. So I will pause there for a second and would love to take questions from the audience and engage in a discussion with you all about the companies we're seeing and the, uh, the trends that we're seeing in the United States and here how it is similar or different to Europe. Thank you. I, I, before we go, I, I, have a, I have a question for you. you. You talked about that you're cooperating with other VCs in, uh, in investing in this space. How do you see the role of government? Do you also cooperate with them or is it a purely uh, VC kind of uh, operation? We do. Well, more so at the Gates Foundation. So at the Gates Foundation, about a third of our investing was in um, public policy research and advocacy. Um, I still participate on many of those panels, but as a, as, a, as a venture capitalist, there's less chance to do so. But I will say the most important thing we've done, like of all the investments we did at the Gates Foundation on public policy, the best ones were where we analyzed what are each of the 50 states doing in this area and who seems to be having the best success? And when we you know, spent a million dollars on a research project for that, we would get back a study that would say, for example, in, um, in some states in the United States, they now have what's called a peak 16 uh, kind of unified view of education from preschool to K-12 to post-secondary. 
And the states that have that are seeing more students go to college with higher graduation rates. And so you can actually analyze along like a particular dimension like that. We also analyze uh, which states have more outcomes-based funding or which states are, have a better utilization of their unemployment programs to help workers get more work and what are the attributes. So it's really good to do research to compare policies from one country to another or from one state to another and see who's doing it the best so you can emulate the better, uh, the better policies. But overall, this is all, a lot of this is public policy, ultimately. Some questions from uh, the audience? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jason, for the very interesting overview uh, of what you have been achieving. Um, you were showing that there's 50% online learning of students. Do you see that because of the high cost of university in the UK, in the US, that the role of universities will be taken off by online learning in the future? Yes. <laughs> in fact, uh, in the U.S. at least, uh, with edX and Coursera, uh, there are multiple programs that exist now for elite universities, for Harvard and MIT and Stanford, to do their own online learning, that those are growing very fast. There actually are more students at Harvard now taking an online learning program than there are physical students at Harvard. Um, now, physical students at Harvard are, are paying a much higher price, and they are, you know, on campus and have a very immersive experience. Uh, but there's still a lot more students taking one of their online learning programs. So in the U.S., at least, online learning has gone mainstream. It's no longer kind of a fringe thing. It's happening at more than 70 percent of U.S. universities have significant, not just a little bit, but significant online learning happening. Usually in the graduate studies programs and older ages, um, professional programs. Uh, hello. In the uh, list of uh, online learning uh, academies, I missed Khan Academy, and I believe that you should start with Kim. <coughs> Why isn't it there in your list? That's a good question. Uh, and Khan Academy is very popular in the U.S. and globally. Uh, it's a, it's a, an oversight that I, I missed them, possibly because they're a nonprofit in the U.S. The Gates Foundation, we actually gave a number of grants to Khan Academy, uh, and, and this learning is very bite-sized. Uh, but it doesn't replace traditional schooling right now. It, it augments it or uh, supplements it. Uh, but you're right, I overlooked that. And I should even say that in the U.S., uh, there are now students in third and fourth and fifth grade uh, in primary school who are being taught computer science, who are being taught to code in Python or Java. Uh, so I don't know if you consider that online learning or not, but they're learning, they're, they're learning digital learning. They're learning 21st century skills now. Uh, so things are moving very fast here. <clears throat> yeah, Jason, thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, the, the, the individual learning possibilities. Now, people can learn in, in the way which is made for them. They can be more flexible, they can be online, they can be all kinds of things. But um, do we also need technology to make dashboarding more available so that you as a student know what's going on, what you need to accomplish, that you're teacher sees it, that, that the people around you see it, and that you have the technology to support also with the use of AI, that you can support all these different learning paths and learning skills. Do you have some companies which develop technology for that? And how do all these people in the learning education industry work together to implement that kind of stuff? Because we need to work together on that. That's really, that's really hard. We definitely do. So, um, I'm a realist in this area. For the last 10 years, um, there's been a lot of talk about, in the United States, we call it personalized learning or adaptive learning. 
So learning based on uh, the system, knowing what you know and what you don't know, and kind of adapting or personalizing the learning to you. And many companies have been invested in and have not succeeded at this. So it is it's definitely <laughs> the future, and it's starting to happen now. At the Gates Foundation, we gave out $20 million in prize for the companies that were the best at personalized learning. Um, and they did have great dashboards, and learners definitely respond well to having knowing how much progress I've made and how much more progress I need to make. Uh, and it helps teachers to know what students understand and don't understand. I think the best way to summarize it is it's, it's much harder to digitize teaching and learning than we all thought. We all thought maybe it would be easy. We would just put you know, some great videos up and some you know, multiple choice quizzes and people would learn better online. And it turned out it's a lot harder to be as good as an in-person teacher with all the interaction and the back and forth and the personalization that teachers do. So, so the world has moved to, almost all of us talk about it as like teacher plus online uh, interactive education. Nobody, very few people talk about it as replacing teachers. It's always augmented teachers. Um, now that said, I also think the future is kind of like what you're experiencing right now. Like, I'm not there, but I am there. And is my presence as strong as a person who was in the room? Probably not quite. But in the future, uh, it might be such, if I was speaking Dutch, maybe I would be even more there, because you would all be understanding slightly better in the native language. Um, but it's getting better. The quality is getting better. The interaction is getting better. I feel like I'm there. I hope you feel the same. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, that? Yeah, Jason, thank you for your explanation. Uh, one thing that I uh, actually uh, caught up uh, out of your story is like uh, going to college and getting uh, the skills that you need to keep up with society costs a lot of money. And we're talking about a people centered economy. Uh, how can artificial intelligence help people with changing policy? Because there's, for me, oh. there is the problem. Because the policy uh, actually excludes people from uh, being part of society. How can artificial intelligence, sorry, contribute to changing policy? <laughs> I'll half answer that. This is a question I'm thinking about all the time. And actually, I hope to write a whole chapter on this next year. Um, right now, many people globally need help with navigation, is, is the best word I can come up with. Navigation is, here's where I am today, what skills I have currently, and here's where I might be able to go to. Like, one way to think about this is LinkedIn. So if you are on LinkedIn, you, right now, you know, it might say your job is project manager, but you don't know what job comes next after a project manager. It's not just senior project manager. You, you could become a controller. You could become uh, a sales operations manager. You could be uh, someone in marketing who does marketing operations. There are so many different jobs. And LinkedIn and other companies now have information about what is the right next job for you. And soon we'll be able to tell you what skills you need or what certificates you need to get that next job. And it's not just about jobs. Uh, most of us have grown up in a world where you would have a job for a long period of time, one year to 10 years. But younger people are That's now me. thinking of jobs as like one week to one month in a different way than we do. And, uh, and so they need navigation even more because they're going to be changing on a very regular basis from job to job. They're going to need new skills in bite-sized chunks. So how does this all relate to policy? In the United States, we have a very bad policy that you can only get federal financial aid if you are a full-time student taking a full load of courses. And this is a big problem because we now have more than half of the students taking part-time courses, nights, weekends, online, and those people cannot access the federal financial aid. They also can't access it 
if they're doing a three-week program or a six-week boot camp program or even a six-month certificate program because you can only access the federal financial aid for degree programs. Now, degree programs are still the gold standard. They are the best. They are a luxury. Everybody wants a degree program, but we have lots of evidence now that 50% of people are taking these certificate and shorter and bite-sized programs, and we need to make the financing available, funding available to those people who are doing part-time and shorter just-in-time programs. This is actually, I think, the problem across Europe, too, is almost all the funding goes only for the full-length degree programs. Yep. If we can make the funding available for any program with proven outcomes, then that's a, a way to uh, make the, the financing sizes closer to the way the reality is actually experienced for students. That would be a huge positive change policy that I want to help drive. Some 16 seconds left to. Uh, <laughs> so that's enough time to thank you very much for your uh, illuminating speech and your very concise answers to the interesting questions. So thank you very much, Jason, and uh, hope to see you soon again. Bravo! Dan gaan we nu naar het wow. panel. Ik zou graag. Uh,